Hi everybody, this is Jacob Reed from ReviewEcon.com. Congratulations on being done with your microeconomics exam. Uh, this is the unboxing video. The questions were released just a few hours ago. I've gone through and done my best to come up with what I think the answers are, or at least what will be accepted on the rubric. Uh, remember though, I haven't seen the rubrics. I don't work for the College Board, although I do score AP microeconomics exams. Uh, but uh, so I don't know for sure what the what questions there or what answers they're going to be looking for but I do have some guesses based on previous rubrics uh, and you never quite know where they're gonna put the bar sometimes they raise the bar to make a question more difficult and other times they lower the bar and make it easier so uh, these are the best guest answers that I have let's go ahead and jump into it and and uh, and and see what the answers are oh before we do that though I want to uh, for thoroughly thank all of you for uh, supporting ReviewEcon.com, for watching the videos, doing the games on the website, and buying the review packets uh, or booklets. And, uh, and of course, uh, thank you for liking and subscribing my videos to help me out with those algorithms and, and all that. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Here is the, uh, this is 2025 Micros FRQ. This is set two. Oh, and by the way, if you don't have one of the questions, uh, either set one or set two, Unfortunately, it means you got one of the uh, questions that is not going to be released. It might have been the one of the uh, um, unreleased, could have been the international version that you could have gotten, uh, or they also have some experimental versions that uh, that aren't released either. So I'm sorry if you got one of those, uh, but but ho hopefully this one that I'm about to show, if it wasn't set one, hopefully you got this one. All right, let's go ahead and jump into it. So first thing we have is Deskward is a typical profit maximizing firm that produces and sells wooden desks in a constant cost, perfectly competitive market, and they are in long run equilibrium. That means they're breaking even, remember. First we have to do, uh, we have to draw side by side graphs and we are going to label, uh, label it as we're supposed to, right? <laughs> let's go ahead and look at what I drew here. There we go, over in the market here, we have a downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply, quantity price on those axes, Label that equilibrium point QM for the quantity and PM for the price. Then over in the firm graph, we have to bring that market price over from the firm graph, show that the PM and PF are equal. That market price is our firm price because they're a price taker. That firm price becomes our Mr. DARP, although you have to have equal signs between all of the variables, MR equals D equals AR equals P. If you, drew, if you wrote all of that, uh, the minimum you need is MR equals D. So that becomes your horizontal marginal revenue and demand. Add in your marginal cost curve, find your MR equals MC quantity, that should be marked QF there. And we have to have our ATC both at its minimum point where it intersects that marginal cost curve and it must be tangent to that demand curve as well. So there you go, that is our graph to start off for the first part, part A. Moving on to part B, if monthly rent, a fixed cost on DeskWords factory uh, building increases, what will happen to the firm's profit maximizing quantity in the short run? We have to explain here. And here's my answer, no change. Because an increase in fixed costs will not increase the ATC, uh, will increase the ATC, but will not change the MC. That means the MR equals MC quantity will stay the same as a result. All right. As, I think as long as you say no change and mention that the marginal cost curve is not moving because this is fixed cost, I think you're gonna be good. All right, moving on to part C. It says, suppose that uh, the government is considering granting a per unit subsidy to producers of wooden desks. On your market graph, this is, by the way, this is just the market graph. We don't have to deal with the firm graph here, just the market side. Show the effect uh, a per unit subsidy uh, will uh, a per unit subsidy will have on each of the following. The new market equilibrium price and quantity of wooden desks, we're gonna label that P star and Q star in the market. There we go. Uh, so this is a subsidy. Subsidies, remember, per unit subsidies are gonna shift that supply curve to the right. So go ahead and shift that supply curve to the right. I have it written as supply minus the subsidy. I don't think they'll require that as long as you have your supply shifted to the right with a lower price marked P star and higher quantity marked Q star. And you don't have to do any of this movement in the in the firm side. Uh, yes, it would move the marginal cost curve, but you don't have to deal with all that. All right, here we go. Uh, we have to now also uh, shade in the area of of the subsidy. So remember, the subsidy is the vertical distance between those two supply curves, and uh, and it's at Q star. So Q star is our new after subsidy quantity. So and the amount of the subsidy is the distance between the two supply curves. Bring those two points all the way over to the axis. So it's that area right there that I have shaded. 
All right, and if you have that area, you'll get your point. All right, over to part D. Instead of a per unit subsidy, suppose the government imposes a binding price floor in the market for wooden desks. Uh, will the price floor result in a shortage of, sur of wooden desks, a surplus of wooden desks, or neither? And we have to explain. Now remember, a binding price floor goes above equilibrium. That will help here. So here's my answer, surplus. Because a greater quantity supplied, uh, because quantity supplied will be greater than the quantity demanded as a result of the binding price floor above equilibrium, right? I'm not sure if that will require me to mention that it's above equilibrium, but there we go, that should help. I think probably they'll just require the quantity supplied being greater than quantity demanded as your explanation. All right, on to part E. Deskward also produces chairs. Deskward increases its production from 500 chairs up to 600 chairs, and its long run total cost increases from $80,000 to $108,000. We're going to calculate first for part I, see, uh, for EI, we're going to calculate Deskward's long run average total cost of producing 500 chairs and show our work. So in order to produce our long run average total cost for 500 chairs, we just take that 80,000 for the, 80, for the uh, starting point and divide it by that 500 chairs. So there's my work, $80,000 divided by 500, uh, 500 chairs equals $160 per chair. That's our average total cost. And you show that work, I think you'll get your point. On to part E double I. As Deskward increases production from 500 chairs up to 600 chairs, is Deskward experiencing economies of scale, diseconomies of scale, or uh, or the efficient scale? Efficient scale, uh, uh, and we have to explain our uh, using numbers. Efficient scale would be uh, the lowest average cost that, that they're in that bottom range. So it's essentially the uh, uh, the const constant returns to scale is what they're referring to as, as the efficient scale there. As far as a term you're probably more likely to know. Uh, minimum efficient scale shows up on the exam every, uh, every once in a while, but uh, so that's what they're referencing there. All right, uh, so explain using numbers. First of all, I'm gonna divide the, uh, um, the cost of producing the 600 chairs, uh, 108,000 divided by 600 chairs gives us $180 worth of cost. And remember it was $160 before. So that tells us it's diseconomies of scale because the long run average total cost increases from $160 up to $180. That means our average total cost curve is upward sloping as we increase output. All right, on to the second question. We have a monopsony graph. We haven't had a monopsony graph on an FRQ in a while. It's back. All right, first we have to identify quartz excavations. This is a mining company. Uh, profit maximizing number of miners to hire. Remember they hire where the marginal revenue product equals the marginal resource cost. In this case, it's called mar marginal factor cost here. And so there's our MRP equals MFC point. Drop down, there is our quantity of four. Just identify it, four, and you get your point. All right, over to B. Will quartz excavations pay its profit maximizing number of miners a wage rate that is equal to $10, greater than $10, or excuse me, equal to $15, greater than $15, or less than $15? And we're going to explain using numbers. So uh, there is, it's $10, by the way. <laughs> so from MRP equals MFC, you drop down to the supply curve below, head on over to that Y axis. That's the wage they're going to pay, it's $10. Uh, but we have to explain using numbers. So uh, I put less than 15 because the firm pays $10. I'm using numbers. Uh, so uh, found at the supply curve below the MFC equals MRP, right? I think that's gonna be enough, right? So, uh, all right, on to the next part for part C. Suppose the government sets a minimum wage price floor on wages of, at $25. Calculate the total wage bill for quartz excavations at the resulting profit maximizing number of miners, and we have to show our work. This is probably the hardest question here. Um, if you got it wrong, I expect most will. But um, so here's what I think the answer is. Uh, the thing is when you have a minimum wage, the marginal factor cost is going to be flat along that wage until we get to the, uh, uh, until the marginal factor cost rises above that minimum wage. So here's what that would look like. See that red line there, uh, excuse me, the red line there, <laughs> the red, I can't remember which side I'm on. <laughs> the uh, red line there is the uh, marginal factor cost uh, for the labor there. Uh, that is uh, uh, the, that is our marginal factor cost. And at $25, that's what it would look like. It would be flat until we hit the marginal factor cost curve 
uh, and then it goes and joins the old one. Uh, and you can see there our MRP equals MFC point there is where that red line intersects the marginal revenue product curve. Drop down, that's a quantity of workers of two. So two workers are gonna be hired is all we got here, and they're being paid $25 each. Multiply that out, two times 25 equals $50. And that's the answer I think we're looking for here. All right, on to part D. Suppose that instead of a minimum wage, there is now an increase in the demand for quartz. Will the marginal revenue product of miners increase, decrease, or remain the same? And we have to explain. So here's my answer here. Increase, because the demand for labor is a derived demand, and the increase in, de in the demand for quartz will increase the price of quartz. And with that, the marginal revenue product, which is the marginal product times the marginal revenue of miners will also increase. All right. There we go, that's what I think the answer is. All right, moving on to the next part, D double I. Uh, after the demand for quartz increases, quartz excavations hires the new profit maximizing number of miners. Uh, will the marginal factor cost of the last miner hired be greater than, less than, or equal to the marginal factor cost of the last miner hired before the demand for quartz increases? So. Uh, uh, you might think that the answer is no change because the marginal factor cost didn't move, but no, the marginal factor cost changes with each new worker. That's why it's upward sloping. That's what that means because we have higher marginal factor costs with higher quantities of workers. So uh, what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna do a hypothetical. I don't know how much it would have shifted, but there we go. There's a rightward shift of a marginal revenue product, right? Uh, so now we have a higher MR equals MC quantity of workers, now we're hiring four, five, uh, five workers instead of four workers, and you'll notice we now have a MRP equals MFC dollar amount of $25. It was $20. So the uh, when we were hiring four workers, the marginal factor cost of that worker, that fourth worker was $20. Now it's $25. So increase is the answer. All right, on to part three. Uh, for question number three, we have two goods. We have good X and good Y. We're asked a bunch of questions about it. First one, uh, if good X and good Y are free, how many units of each will maximize Lucy's total utility? Remember, if something's free, you're gonna keep on buying it as long as it's worth something. So we're just gonna not buy the units there where there are negative numbers, right? So there we go. Uh, so we're gonna have five of good X because the sixth one, the unit of good X actually decreases, uh, has a negative marginal utility. And the uh, and then four uh, units of good Y because that fifth unit uh, is worth negative four utils. So those are the utility maximizing amounts. You keep going until it's zero. It's never zero there, but you don't do it when it's negative in that case. All right, moving on to part B. We're going to calculate Lucy's total utility if she consumes two units of good X, two units of good Y, and we're going to show our work. So remember, those are the units we are producing, and these are marginal, this is marginal utility, so we have to add them all up, right, to get our total utility. So you're just gonna add 20 plus 16 plus 28 plus 24. Those are the utils that Lucy is going to gain from, from consuming two of each of these products. And there we go, 88 is our answer. All right, for part C, suppose that uh, instead that the price of each unit of good X is $2 and the price of each unit of good Y is $4. Lucy has a budget of $20 to spend on the two goods. If Lucy purchases two units of good X, what is the maximum quantity of good Y Lucy can purchase? This is a pretty easy question. Uh, I'm surprised they asked it because not a lot of econ this question but here's how I'm gonna figure it out. We're just gonna take our $20, uh, Lucy's $20, and subtract the $2 for each of the units of good X, because they're $2 each. That leaves her with $16 left. So we're gonna take the $16, divided by the $4 that good Y costs, and that gives us four units. Just simply state, four. No explanation needed, and no work needed to be shown, just four. All right, moving on to part C double I. What is Lucy's optimal combination of good X and Y? Explain using marginal analysis and numbers. All right, and first, in order to be able to answer this question, we're going to add, throw in our marginal utility per dollar calculations on the chart we have. And then Lucy is going to purchase one unit at a time until she has been able to spend all of her $20. That first unit 
And, and that's what we're gonna say in the explanation here. So she's first, those are all the units she's gonna buy. First thing she's gonna buy is the, uh, the first unit of good X for 10 utils per dollar. Then she's going to buy uh, a unit of good Y for seven utils per dollar. A unit of, then switch back over to uh, good X for eight units per dollar or eight utils per dollar. Then she's gonna buy one of each Finally, she will buy one of each again. Uh, that was six utils per dollar for the uh, third unit of good X and the, sixth, and the second unit of good Y. And then she buys four, uh, uh, one more of unit, the fourth unit of good X and the third unit of good Y. And so there you go, explain that all out and uh, using numbers uh, to get your answer. All right, so there is my answer, four units of good X and three units of good Y. She keeps on buying the margin, the product with the highest marginal utility per dollar until all money has been spent. That's the order of 10, seven, eight, six, six, four, and four. Uh, so I'm gonna, I put all of that in my answer just to make sure that we get those points because it says to use marginal analysis along with numbers. I think that'll all get you the point. It's a lot to write, all right? On to part D, suppose that the price elasticity of demand for good X is negative two, the price elasticity of demand for good Y is negative uh, 0.8, the cross price elasticity of demand for good X and good Y is 1.6, are the goods, uh, are goods X and Y complementary goods, substitute goods, normal goods, or inferior goods, and we have to explain. So uh, a lot of distraction in there, the negative numbers, uh, the cross price, uh, excuse me, the price elasticity of demand and the, and the uh, and the, for the two goods, that's not relevant here. We're, we're talking, we just need to focus on the cross price elasticity uh, and that 1.6 positive number means that they are substitutes because the cross price elasticity uh, demand coefficient is positive. And if you say that, I think you'll get your last point. And there you have it. Those are my best guess answers uh, for this year's FRQ. That was uh, uh, set two and for microeconomics uh, 2025. I really appreciate all uh, of your support for ReviewEcon.com. If you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe. Make sure you uh, hit that like button to uh, help out with the algorithm. Share this video with anybody who took the microeconomics exam as well. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck on the macro exam if you're taking that one also. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Take care. I'll see you all next time.